Okay, that's debt financing. Uh, now let's talk about uh, financing infrastructure through equity. I remember, uh, equity is money acquired um, basically from shareholders. So a utility it would be buying or borrowing money uh, from itself. Uh, investors and shareholders do require some return on equity uh, on their investment. Um, when, when shareholders buy uh, a slice of ownership uh, of a company, um, they're hoping uh, that that investment will earn them money, uh, whether that's in the form of increased uh, prices in, of the stock um, or dividend payments. So uh, the distribution of profits uh, to shareholders. So who do you think owns the, um, the, the shares or the stock um, of electric power utilities? For example, Duke Energy. Um, and I'll give you a hint. Um, it's not someone with the last name Duke, right? Duke's not a, or not, is not anymore uh, a family owned company. So here it is. Here's a, a very small part of that list. Um, the, the largest shareholder of Duke Energy as of today uh, owns just over seven and a half percent, and that's the Vanguard Group. And you can take a look at all of these other. Um, entities that own pieces of, of Duke Energy. And you don't have to go far down the list until you get to uh, uh, decimals uh, that are under uh, one, right? So, and this list goes on and on and on, and the numbers get smaller and smaller and smaller. And so the first takeaway here is that a lot of different entities own a company like Duke Energy. Um, the other thing to take a look at is some of the names. Uh, here and you might recognize some. So you might recognize some State Farm Insurance, uh, BlackRock, Fidelity Management, um, T. Rowe Price, um, the Vanguard Group. Um, these are what we would describe as um, institutional investors. So what is an institutional investor? An institutional investors are, in short, um, groups that have lots and lots and lots of money. Uh, and these can in include insurance companies, banks, mutual funds, university endowments, um, hedge funds, pension funds, uh, et cetera. So institutional investors um, have so much money because they collect it um, from and often on behalf of ordinary people. Think about a pension fund. Um, you know, the, the state employees retirement program for North Carolina uh, state employees, including employees of our university. And so what institutional investors do uh, with all of this money is they spread it out. They take a little piece here and a little piece there, and they invest in lots and lots of different uh, companies. Um, so they diversify their investment, uh, hoping that on average, um, over a long period of time, they will earn a stable profit. So what does this mean? It means that companies like Duke Energy, energy utility, electric utilities, are sliced up and owned by lots and lots of big investors who in turn represent lots and lots of small investors, like, for example, me. So in the interest of uh, full disclosure, um, when I save money for retirement every month um, through the, my, the North Carolina State Retirement Program, um, I put my money uh, in mutual funds that are managed by the Vanguard Group. Now, I have no idea if it actually gets funneled to Duke Energy, but I would not be surprised in any way if some part of the money that I is pulled from my paycheck and saved on my behalf for my retirement ends up um, uh, at Duke Energy. So I mentioned that even though um, you know, equity financing is not technically borrowing um, because no interest is truly paid to shareholders, um, investors do require a return on their investment. Um, and so how do we, do we estimate what that return on equity should be? So we can think of it um, in a similar way um, to, to the lesson we learned from debt financing, which is um, there's sort of a, a risk versus reward trade-off. The example from the debt financing was that if there were a utility or a company uh, 
um, that was in really poor financial health, that might indicate um, that they have a higher probability of not paying that loan off um, or returning that money to the, the people that lent them the money in the first place. Um, and so as a result, um, the investors, which are the people that lend them the money, would require a higher interest rate. Um, and so there's something similar um, when we're talking about return on equity, uh, which is the rule of thumb uh, that the higher the risk involved, the higher the reward or the rate of return that would be demanded by shareholders. So shareholders who buy or own slices of companies that are perceived to be quite risky um, probably expect a higher rate of return on average. So the formal way um, of expressing this in finance, uh, this relationship between risk and reward, uh, is the capital asset pricing model, or CAPM. Um, and what this figure shows is some measure of, of risk um, on the x-axis. So we could think of that as, uh, from an investor standpoint, the probability of buying some sort of stock and losing all your money and never seeing your money again. Um, and on the y-axis, rate of return or profit. Um, now, the, the dotted yellow line that stretches from left to right uh, represents the point on the y-axis, the rate of return, that's associated with U.S. Treasury bonds. Uh, and so we refer to this rate as the risk-free rate, and that's because um, it is generally assumed that the probability that the U.S. government um, does not pay its debt back on time. In other words, when they sell bonds and borrow money, the probability that they do not pay that money back to individual investors who buy the bonds is essentially zero. But above that dotted yellow line, what we see, and this is demonstrated by the solid yellow line, is that if you want to receive a rate of return or a, 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 a profit margin um, on your investment, um, that is greater than the, the interest rate on U.S. Treasury bonds, it requires you to take risk. Um, and that the, the higher the rate of return you're seeking, uh, the more risky the investment um, will be. So we've, we've talked about financing through debt and financing through equity. So what's, what's a better way to finance infrastructure, um, debt or equity? So there's a trade-off here. Um, debt is a legal obligation, right? If you do not pay your debt back on time, you go bankrupt. So it's a, it's a more inflexible type of financing. However, there is a lower interest rate associated with debt. Uh, for equity, there's a higher return sought by investors, um, and that's because there's no guarantee that shareholders will receive um, any return on their investment. For electric utilities uh, in particular, um, they tend to be very highly reliant on debt as opposed to equity, uh, at least relative to, to other types of companies. And that's for a couple different reasons. The first is, again, they're very capital intensive, which means that when utilities build stuff, it costs a lot of money. And so cheap interest, lower interest rates on debt matters a lot. And it actually um, is one way to to keep uh, the cost of infrastructure um, uh, and essentially the, the cost of electricity lower for consumers is to rely more on debt, even though it's a legal obligation. Um, now, what offsets some of that um, inflexibility of relying a lot on debt for utilities um, is that utilities uh, tend to be in a market that's highly regulated with fairly constant demand. Um, and what that means is that um, it gives lenders or the people that buy bonds from utilities uh, some assurance that they're going to be paid back. And so as a result, um, utilities generally have pretty good credit ratings. And so the interest rates on debt are usually pretty low. So if we wanted to, to think about an even simpler way uh, to represent um, uh, the way a, a utility might um, or any sort of company might might finance um, infrastructure. We could um, we could use the weighted average cost of capital, and so this is a way of combining uh, 
um, and simplifying the interest rate on debt and the return on equity for shareholders into a single percentage weight. Um, this is essentially just a weighted average of the interest rate on debt and the return on equity. So the left-hand side of this equation is the weighted average cost of capital, and it's going to be expressed as a percentage. Um, and on the right-hand side, we see D over D plus E, and that means, and D here is the amount of money of the project that is uh, the amount of the capital cost um, that's debt financed over the total capital cost, D plus E, um, and that's multiplied times the interest rate on debt, and then we add that to uh, E over D plus E, and so E here is the amount of the capital cost of the project um, that is equity financed um, over the total capital cost, D plus E, times the return on equity. So let's look at a, at a really simple example. Uh, here we're going to say the amount of um, the project cost that's financed through debt is $100 million. Uh, the amount of the project cost that is uh, financed using shareholders' equity is $30 million. Um, the interest rate on debt is 5.5%, and the, interest, the return on equity for shareholders is 9%. So if we plug in those values, we get $100 million in debt is D over D plus E, which is 100 plus 30, so $130 million times the interest rate on debt, 5.5%, plus $30 million in equity, E over D plus E, which is $130 million, times 9%, uh, which is the ret uh, return on equity for shareholders. And if you add all these numbers up, you get a weighted average cost of capital of 6.3%. So I want to end with a, sort of an applied example um, uh, about how the, the cost of financing can impact the cost of electricity. Specifically, uh, what we're going to refer to as the break-even cost of electricity or the, 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 the price of a, that uh, a power plant would have to sell its electricity uh, to break even or make all its money back at the end of its lifetime. Um, and so let's just pretend we have a, a 500 megawatt uh, power, power plant, a coal plant. And just a, a, a brief note on uh, the units. Uh, so we're going to come back and use these units um, a lot uh, throughout the semester. So let's uh, sort of establish a firm footing uh, uh, from the start, when we talk about the size of a power plant or its capacity, um, the units are megawatts. So the capacity of a power plant is its ability, the amount of electricity or power that could be produced at any given moment. Um, when we talk about electricity, so the actual production from a power plant, um, those units are in megawatt hours. So important to keep straight. Um, so we're going to talk about the what the, the break-even cost of electricity uh, from a 500 megawatt power plant would be and, and how that's impacted by financing costs. Um, so when we say break-even cost of electricity, we're talking about um, a dollar per megawatt hour amount or price um, that that plant would have to sell its electricity for um, to make its money back. And so one way of estimating what that cost would be is to say, well, let's, let's take the total lifetime costs of the power plant and divide those by the, the total amount of electricity it sells over its lifetime. So what would the total lifetime costs be? Well, the first one would be the capital cost of the plant. How much money did it take to actually to build that plant up uh, and, and, and turn it on? Uh, we, also, by now, know that we have to add to the, the, the capital cost of, of the plant the interest paid uh, on that, uh, that borrowed sum, whether that's through debt or return on equity to shareholders. Um, and we also have to add to the, the cost of building the plant um, the cost of operating the plant over 25 years. And let's just assume that all that's required in this case is buying the coal or the fuel that operates the plant. So that's total cost, total lifetime costs. Um, in terms of the total amount of electricity uh, sold over 25 years, we're going to just sort of assume that um, the plant is operating at capacity.
Uh, and so what do these numbers look like for two different weighted average costs of capital? Um, so this, these rep, the, on the y-axis here, you have the electricity cost or the break-even cost of electricity in dollars per megawatt hour for the exact same power plant um, that sells the exact same amount of electricity over its lifetime, but has two different weighted average costs of capital. And what you see uh, is that the plant with the, the lower weighted average cost of capital, and that could mean a lower interest rate on debt or a lower return on equity for shareholders, is able to sell electricity to customers at a lower price uh, and break even uh, than its uh, counterpart that experiences a higher, a 5% weighted average cost of capital. So the take home message here is that all else equal, a utility's financial health impacts the price of electricity um, in, in, a, in, a, in a fairly straightforward way, right? So if you are a utility and on your balance sheet, um, it indicates that you are uh, experiencing um, financial troubles that might make it more difficult for you to pay your debts off. Uh, in the future, um, a credit rating agency will give you a lower credit score. And when you go to borrow money, uh, investors, whether that's uh, bond buyers or people that want to buy shares in your company, will charge a higher interest rate for that borrowed sum. That higher interest rate translates to a larger amount of interest paid over, uh, paid back uh, to the investors and a larger lifetime cost of building the infrastructure. Um, when we put that cost on a dollar per megawatt hour basis, what it translates to is a higher cost of electricity for customers. So next time uh, we are going to talk about uh, net present value and project valuation. Um, and please read, uh, go through reading number two for the next lecture. Okay, see you there.